Welcome, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this event, which is part of Santa Clara University's IT Ethics and Law Lecture Series, co-sponsored by the Markula Center for Applied Ethics and the High Tech Law Institute. My name is Irina Raiku, and I'm the director of the Internet Ethics Program at the Markula Center for Applied Ethics. Before introducing our speakers, I just want to remind you that you can add your questions at any point in the Q&A section, and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. We are recording this event and plan to make it available soon. I also want to take a minute to acknowledge that we are holding this conversation while massive battles and humanitarian disasters are taking place in the real unaugmented world. The invasion of Ukraine might prompt us to consider the ways in which VR and AR will or already do play a role in warfare and military training, as well as in efforts to help people move beyond traumas or to help them understand the experiences of others living lives very different from their own. Our speakers today are philosopher Eric Ramirez and attorney Brian H Britton Heller. I apologize, Britton. <laughs> Britton Heller is an attorney who specializes in advising companies on issues such as privacy, freedom of expression, content moderation, civic engagement, cyber hate and hate speech, and online extremism. She was the founding director of the Center on Technology and Society for the Anti-Defamation League and has collaborated with major online platforms and gaming companies to combat cyber hate. She has also produced and launched new technology for good in mediums including AR, VR, and XR. Heller previously worked for the International Criminal Court and the U.S. Department of Justice's Criminal Division, prosecuting grave human rights violations. Eric Ramirez is an associate professor in Santa Clara University's Philosophy Department and the author of the book titled The Ethics of Virtual and Augmented Reality, Building Worlds, published in 2021. And there it is. He is interested in all aspects of moral psychology, and for the past several years, his research has centered on exploring interdisciplinary issues involving the ethics of developing and using virtual reality technologies. He is especially interested in the ethics of using VR for experiments, empathy enhancement, and behavioral modification, and has developed virtual reality modules of classic thought experiments. I'm going to ask Eric to take it away for us. And, and thanks for that introduction, Marina. So I'll, I'll share my screen uh, with some slides that I'll use to structure, uh, and then I'll, I'll stop once I'm done. And um, what I'm going to spend most of my time doing today is just start with a really brief introduction into just what extended reality is, and then focus most of what I'm going to say about what I think are pressing now style issues that we need to deal with as this technology is being developed, commercialized, as um, Meta is spending hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to lay down the infrastructure for the future metaverse. I think there are some things we need to talk about now. And then I'll end with what I think are longer term questions about the effects and maybe social, social questions that, that these technologies are gonna force us to answer. And to begin with, just what is extended reality? Um, for, for me, I think of extended reality as a, as a large family of technologies, um, most of them current, but not, not all. And what they share, what they all share in common is just that they are different ways of talking about overlaying immersive content onto your experience. And, and it's the immersive part that I think makes these technologies different from the screen you're using to watch this webinar on, right? Which is also overlaying content onto your experience. So really, I mean, going, far, going as far back as the, the late 50s, things like this mining tool that was called the mascot, these kinds of technologies, how the way this worked, there's a camera up here on this machine and there's a, it's feeding the visuals into the user here. The user controls the robot with the two hand devices here. And it was things like the mascot that actually first started getting psychologists interested in the concept that we now call presence, right? This weird experience that users would have about being somewhere they're not, right? So people controlling this mascot would feel like they were wherever the mascot was as opposed to sitting in a room. And as these kinds of technologies got developed, right, like it started taking into account some really interesting opportunities like combining modalities, right? This is combining a visual stimulus with a sense, right? With an olfactory one, the sensorama. And by the time we get to the 80s, I think we get something that's really quite modern looking, quite contemporary looking in terms of how head mounted displays, haptic gloves, things like that as control interfaces for things like training. The NASA used this specifically for training astronauts. 
And so when we talk about virtual reality, I really think, or extended reality, there are lots of ways of talking about this. And for me, the only real difference is how much of our experience is being replaced with something simulated. If you talk about cave style VR systems where you enter into a room and everything is a digital projection or traditional head mounted display style VR, what those have in common is really it's replacing almost everything with a simulated experience. Whereas when you think of things like Pokemon Go, which is an augmented reality game, right? It's just replacing a small part of your field with augmented, with simulated content. The Microsoft HoloLens can do a lot more than that. And so really what I'm asking questions about are what are some issues that these kinds of technologies are forcing us to deal with both now and then, and then in, into the future. And so for me, when I think about um, what a lot of my research has been focused on is about thinking about the psychology of simulated experience. And I think what we learn about the psychology of simulated experience is that under the right conditions, simulated experiences can feel like real experiences and that that adds an obvious ethical dimension to the development and use of these simulations. What I'm showing you here is uh, on the left, if you're familiar with a psychologist by the name of Stanley Milgram, he did some really important but infamous experiments in the late 60s about authority and obedience uh, that involved just asking people to shock subjects. If you have heard of these, you know that you can't replicate Stanley Milgram's experiments today because they're found to be unethical. The risks and subjective trauma they imposed on subjects were seen as not outweighing, uh, not being outweighed by any benefits that subjects got out of participation in these studies. In fact, it was experiments like this that led to the creation of a whole set of protections and guidelines now on human subjects research, uh, what we call institutional review boards that have to approve all this research. What I think is interesting is that when Milgram's experiment was replicated in virtual reality, one of the things that we saw was a very similar kind of subjective experience on the part of subjects. They were experiencing anxiety, subjective trauma, to way, in ways that actually shocked the experimenter. Slater himself did not expect that result. And so one thing I think we learned from the study of virtual experience and the psychology of virtual experience is we need a lot stronger protection in terms of how subjects can respond to simulated content. I do think the immersive nature of virtual reality makes it very different than the exact same content experience on a flat screen, for example. And so we've already had examples of, I think, consumer uh, corporations accidentally producing traumatizing content in VR because they weren't as familiar with these, the, the, these design questions. And I do think we need to have much stronger protections at the level of institutional review boards. Obviously this experiment carried through. Somebody approved it because simulated experiences weren't understood as being harmful or risky enough to prevent this, this study from going through. And I think that was a mistake. I also think that we need to get better at acknowledging the limitations of virtual reality and extended reality experiences. So everything that I'm showing you right now is really just uh, different simulations, all of which are, are they're aiming to give you a kind of experience, right? The experience of being a cow, the experience of being pregnant, uh, the experience of, uh, of anti-black racism. This puts you into the body of a black man to experience racism. This is a simulation that was created by uh, director Alejandro Iñárritu, which is meant to give you the experience of uh, migrating into the US, but with, without documents. And I think that we have really good reasons for thinking that virtual reality can't actually do this, that it can't give you these kinds of experiences. And that if we use this technology to give, to make people think that they are having these experiences, we're doing them a disservice. It's a form of, I think, an ethical manipulation. And so we need to get better at acknowledging what the technologies are really good for, but also what they can't do. The other thing that I want to just mention briefly, because I know, Britton, you're going to talk a, a bit more about data privacy and some of the issues about biometric data, is to think about what these things are and what kinds of data they can collect. If you look at an HMD like this, you'll notice immediately it's got cameras, right? It's got a lot of cameras on it. These cameras can record, obviously, not just the room you're in and who, who might be in it, but also other kinds of intimate information about you, not just where you happen to be sitting, how tall you are, but also where you're looking, right? So uh, some of these are equipped with eye tracking technology that can be used to figure out what you're looking at within a simulation. Uh, the, the HMDs at our own lab in Santa Clara can also measure not just where you're looking, but um, the, uh, 
the diameter of your pupils to also guess at how much attention you're giving to the thing you're looking at. All things that you might think are extremely valuable in an attention economy, but also really intimate forms of user biometric data. What these are used for ostensibly are things like making new interfaces. So I can track your hands in VR with these external cameras so you don't need clunky handsets. But again, that's I think a kind of intimate kind of data that we need to get better at protecting. Meta, then Facebook was already experimenting with using these cameras also just to read and track facial expressions. So this is tracking user facial expression to then carry over the expression onto digital avatars. And here too, I just think, um, and, and again, Britain will say much more about this. We need to be not only more knowledgeable about what kinds of biometric data these things can collect, but also how we protect user privacy with, uh, while trying to make use of the things I think these are good for or useful for. Speaking very quickly about long-term challenges, I think that the long-term challenge that we're gonna face more than any other about this is thinking about the self. And in particular, what I think is a conflict between the way we normally think about the self now as being embodied in a physical way with how we might be embodied in an augmented reality or metaverse environment. And I think we're already dealing with this problem in a really low level way by looking at how people are responding to AR filters on things like Snapchat, TikTok, any, anything like that, um, is a form of augmented reality embodiment. And we're already seeing specific forms of body dysmorphic disorder arising from, sometimes called Snapchat dysphoria here, right? People having a kind of mismatch between their augmented reality self and their physical self. And when we look at the options for embodiment that the metaverse is going to allow, this is just from an image from uh, Meta's Horizons uh, metaverse space, right? And all of these are people in the metaverse. Look at the vast array, array of embodiment options that they have, that there's going to be some interesting conflicts between augmented and physical embodiment. This is from a study that was done uh, five years ago on avatar customization. And this is a user, I think, making exactly the point that I think we need to be more interested in. In real life, you're stuck with what you're born with, but in VR, you can be what you truly feel like you are inside. Notice the privileging of augmented reality embodiment over physical embodiment. I think this conflict is gonna be really important, lead to lots of questions about who should have control over how people think about their embodiment in AR, how we keep track of people in, in, in AR given the forms of embodiment are possible questions about AR overlays with respect to property rights, who, who can overlay information over my house or over public spaces, I think are things that we don't have a, a lot of framework for right now. And we're going to need to address as these things become less and less strange when the metaverse becomes less some odd thing and more like when we talk about the internet. I think we need to have answers to these questions already in place. And I look forward to hearing more. I look forward to engaging with all of you. That's the end of, of uh, what I wanted to say and just acknowledge all the people that have worked on this. Thanks, Mark and Lysander, Irina, Britain, everybody, and uh, I'll stop. So before we jump to Britain's portion, I just want one point of clarification. Can you talk for a couple of seconds about what you mean when you say keep track of people? Uh, uh, yeah, so embodiment. Uh, when th the reason I catch that, I, I put that as a long-term question is I'm imagining that the metaverse becomes in a way like the internet, meaning it's a space that we all have access to at any given point, just either by having a specific device that links us to it, or um, if it's an augmented reality overlay, it could just be something we're wearing basically at all times because all the interesting things about social and political life are there, right? In the way that it's hard to do this, to have social and political life without being on the internet. So in that sense, I mean, uh, right now, there's a lot of cool evolutionary psychology about how it is that when we booted up this, this meeting, I recognized that it was Britain that I was looking at or how I recognize that it's you, Irina. And all of those presume a really tight link between the self and the body. And so I think when we talk about augmented reality embodiment, all of these old psychological heuristics we used to track people are gone, right? Because you can look and sound any way you, you, you want. And uh, yeah, I think we need some way of keeping track of users across spaces. And we ideally using a system that doesn't require a kind of corporate or state-based surveillance system. Uh, and, and yeah, I think those are, those are longer term questions that we, we don't have great frameworks for right now. We're exploring, I think you've heard me talk about this before, Rena. we're exploring all sorts of weird answers uh, 
like turning identity into an NFT or to think about turning identity into some kind of correlated pattern of anonymous activity we can track across spaces. But but it's it's tough to think about good ways of doing that that don't require like a database of like NFT keys assigned to a person or something. So that brings us very much to questions of privacy law and biometrics law and a lot of things that I know Britain has been writing and talking about for a long time now. Britain, please go ahead. Thanks, Eric. I just wanted to say that in VR, I'm a flying toaster. So uh, shout out to all you Windows 95 fans out there. Um, so, all right, everyone. I'm, I'm gonna shout out to the gamers and the NASCAR fans. Let's imagine that you and I are playing a racing game in VR. I see this red McLaren and I get really, really excited. My heart rate speeds up and my skin gets a little bit moist and my pupils dilate. I, I really, really like this car. Later on, while I'm still in VR, I, I start seeing red cars that remind me of the race car. I see them, they're being driven by someone who looks a little bit like me. I start receiving ads for auto insurance in my social media feed. I get targeted ads about why now is a great time to get an auto loan. The type of information that my body gave off when I experienced pleasure in looking at the car is traceable by the current type of sensors that we have in AR and VR. And it used to just be available in a lab, but it's quickly becoming available commercially. The type of information that I'm talking about, where Eric talked about all the cameras in the head-mounted device. Um, I had someone once describe a head-mounted device to me as a, a polygraph with six cameras. So the type of information that you emit when you're in virtual reality releases a digital exhaust. So this information gathered by sensors combined with biological and anatomical unique identifiers gave the video game company access to potentially intimate information. Through pupillometry, you can actually tell things about someone like who they're sexually attracted to, whether or not they're telling the truth and whether or not they're likely to develop medical ailments like schizophrenia, Parkinson's, autism, or ADHD. And it picks up preclinical signs, so things that people may not even be aware that they have the proclivity to develop themselves. So while this sounds like science fiction, it's actually close to present reality, not virtual reality. In May 2020, Facebook Oculus announced that it would start putting advertisements in VR. Within five days, the pilot company called Blasting VR canceled the initiative. And this move was seen to be a turning point for the industry, bringing one of social media's most controversial features into a new medium that inspires both idealism and alarm. Today, I'm gonna to bring up five points for you directed for lawyers and companies and legislators about what I think we need to know on, at, at this tipping point in the technology. Number one, this is not social media. There has been nothing like this before. I'm a human rights lawyer who focuses on technology and I'm very worried about the present inability of, of law and regulation to grapple with these hardware and software-based challenges. This is because as Eric alluded to, what happens in an immersive environment feels real. It's actually processed in your hippocampus in the same way that memories are processed. So don't think about virtual reality in the same way you think about scrolling through a Facebook or a Twitter feed. Think about it as inviting someone into your home, having them sit next to you on a couch and engaging with them one-on-one -on -one instead of just reading their words across the screen. Because of this, I argue that we should have a higher duty of care for this technology with greater awareness of issues related to consent, privacy, and human rights. Some people have, have begun to term this neuro rights or mental privacy. Two, VR is a different hardware because of the way immersive sensors work. So as, as there's widespread adoption of AR and VR and it's becoming more and more imminent, so does the potential for massive data collection at scale. 
even more so than your smartphone, VR captures a wealth of information about you. So think about what Eric uh, was talking about. What is needed to orient you in a digital space? The sensors capture your precise head and hand motions. They take pictures of your surroundings through tracking cameras. Microphone audio is picked up through voice command systems and eye tracking determines what you're focusing on and how intently. Jeremy Balenson of Stanford recently produced some research that discovered that within 30 minutes of VR content, you could uniquely identify an individual. Conceptions of personal identifying information in VR AR look completely different than what legislators have previously thought about. You can also uniquely identify somebody by the tilt of their head and the way they point. So no disco dancing in VR. Um, future headsets are going to offer more intimate details like eye tracking, which are going to offer incredibly precise metrics about what captures your attention in a VR space. And you're already seeing this start to be monetized in web-based applications. MoviePass recently relaunched and announced that users could watch ads for microcredits, but the ads would pause if the eye scanning algorithm determined that a user wasn't paying attention to them. Immersive technology is unique in that it not only tracks your reaction to stimuli in a way that these sensors need to function, but it also creates a record of the stimuli itself. And this is very valuable information to advertisers and third parties, especially when there's not a clear route to monetization for the industry. Which leads me to number three, existing biometrics law won't protect us. Many people, even the fellow lawyers, are surprised to learn that biometrics law may not cover these kind of risks. Recent lawsuits, like one filed by the state of Texas, um, claim that Meta violated user privacy through using a facial recognition algorithm. This makes sense because biometrics is centered around the concept of your identity. But many VR users log into their, um, their now Meta Quest with their Facebook social media account. The company has gone back and forth three times at this point about whether or not you can use your Facebook ID to log into your Oculus. There are different terms of service governing each one of these legal regimes. The legacy people, the people who sign up for an account, um, and the people who um, basically can use either. They're trying to standardize this now, but Regardless of which regime you use, you have to have a verifiable billing address to download immersive content. This is like the early days of the internet. Your identity is not necessarily what's at issue here to me. It's your thoughts and your preferences. It's your privacy. XR devices take biometric data and make it about personal data collection. So this takes it to a different level by combining existing data streams on people's demonstrated preferences, likes, and dislikes with anatomical data on an ongoing basis. While PII um, uh, and biometric data and the risks that that entails are often discussed, this leads itself to a deeper, the way that this could create deeper user profiles is not often discussed. Bio, um, biometric data may in fact be the window into a user's most private thoughts and their involuntary reactions and feelings. So to accommodate for this, I've proposed a concept called biometric psychography. This concept captures the level of intimate, um, intimate knowledge that companies will be able to collect on individuals using a combination of their biometric data and their psychographic data. And that's a term from advertising, meaning your likes, your dislikes, and your preferences. So biometric psychography is the behavioral and anatomical information used to identify or measure a person's reaction to stimuli over time, which provides insights into a person's mental, physical, and emotional state, as well as their interests. To summarize it in normal people speak, it's the like button on steroids. XR headsets will not only be able to track what people pay attention to, but for how long, with what intensity, and what their specific emotional response to stimuli is. And this can be gleaned through a combination of pupil dilation, 
micro expressions and facial muscle, muscles, and in some cases, galvanic skin responses, EEGs, EMGs, and ECGs. So four, this matters because biometric laws are designed to protect identity and not privacy. So again, the main issues around XR are different. It's consent and privacy. How can you consent when the data collected on users will be involuntary? It is your unconscious and uncontrollable biological responses that are going to be tra transformed into data points. And so users don't, will no longer actively participate in a data collection pro process. It's, very, it's their very reaction to stimuli, which will be the data. You can't control your pupil dilation. You can't control your heart rate. You can't control if you start to sweat a little bit when, um, when, when you see things that stress you out. Additionally, there are issues related to bystander consent that have to be grappled with. There is no norm for recording in public or even for signaling that you wanna opt out of being a subject of someone else's recording. The industry has tried to put lights in smart glasses when recording, but civil liberties group have pushed back saying smart glasses, these lights can be covered up or disabled very easily. So um, I, I know I'm running short on time, so I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Um, so number five, I, I think we need to define industry best practices. And very quickly, there are four things. One, you can press companies about their monetization schemes and in particular, their ads policy. You have to understand that ads don't look like billboards in the metaverse. They're branded experiences that are, that are entertaining. Many of us seek them out, we even pay for them. You go to the Jurassic Park experience to feed a dinosaur, but it's actually an ad to get you to see the next movie. And what better way to, to do that than to have you feed the dinosaur, right? Um, it's, it's more persuasive than a billboard. And for a human rights-centric approach, approach, I would press for bodily feedback to not be used for commercial purposes based on the inability to meaningfully consent. Um, you should look to on-device storage as a best practice for privacy. And for many people concerned about hacking, surveillance, or inappropriate oversight, this is the answer you're looking for. It gets complicated because there's limited storage capacity in the hardware right now, and many companies are going to start looking to cloud storage as a backup. Um, this, this is going to make the hardware and the, the privacy demands and the storage demands go head to head as users demand longer recordings and more features in a, a limited hardware scale. And three, you need to involve engineers in the discussion. Bluntly, there's only, only so much memory you can put in a head mounted device. There's only so much light that you can omit externally before the camera can't function. Consumers need to understand not only how their device works, but why it works the way it does. And then they can ask for better things. And three, and we can get into this in the questions a little more, is we need to design these devices for all people. New research by Jessica Outlaw of the Extended Mind shows that disabled populations are some of the earliest adopters of XR technology. Yet fundamental controls for vision and vantage point weren't integrated into uh, Oculus Quest programming until version 30. This means if I was in a wheelchair, I wouldn't be able to have the vantage point of a standing person until July, last July, it, it, it's ridiculous. Um, Non-adjustable interpupillary distances disadvantaged women who on average have a smaller and I would say prettier heads than um, the average user that the HMB was designed for. The distance between your pupils is as important when you're, when you're wearing glasses as the, um, as the lenses themselves. So for many women who weren't the, uh, didn't have the proportions the original headsets were designed for, it, it was like they're putting on the wrong prescription glasses, which is why women reported getting simulation sickness at higher rates than men. An MIT researcher took an go to Nigeria and found that the straps snapped half of the time that uh, she tried to fit them over African subjects' hairstyles. We can and we should do better. So uh, those are the ethical issues that I am uh, thinking about and happy to discuss with you all. So I have so many questions, but we're getting already uh, great questions from the audience and I encourage you to add more. Um, 
First, I should say that if from now on you see me going around campus with a tiara that says, do not consent to being recorded, it's because of what Britain <laughs> said. Um, there might be a, a market for signaling devices <laughs> coming up. Um, and I'm interested, you know, you had said we need to design for um uh, design them for all people, but there's definitely been pushback by some who argue that they should not be used by children. Um, so I'm going to ask Eric to just talk a little bit about the use of VR by children and what are some particular issues related to that? Uh, yeah, so I mean, on the one hand, I think it's good to note that even, you know, even the manufacturers themselves, right, if you look at the Oculus Health and Safety Handbook, they tell you not to use it if you're under 13. Um, and, and I think there are, there are good reasons for being extra cautious with children, uh, not just because, you know, the ACM code of ethics says that we should be or something, but I think, yeah, because I think the developmental effects on children are still pretty unknown. And, um, one thing that I do think we do know about general experience in virtual reality, at least if you're in there for, let's say 20 or 30 minutes, when you come out of that experience, you do tend to have, for example, as an adult, much higher dissociation and derealization of your real life experiences as a result of having spent some time in virtual reality. And so I, I, I do think right now we don't yet know that much about how this will affect certain kinds of developmental uh, milestones in children who, are, who have to make that dissociation uh, growth, right? They have to be able to distinguish the, the, what's in their imagination from what's really happening. And it's, so I, I think we in general should be extra cautious about children and any technology, but in this one, especially because it's psychological effects on adults are known well enough to think it might cause developmental issues in children. We gotta be extra careful, uh, yeah. Yeah, and to add to that, uh, recent studies that I've seen show that there there could be some benefits, but some of, there also may be some harm to um, kids' spatial perception because the way that you um, the, the way that that worlds are rendered in VR is not exactly the same as as, as they are um, you know in in meat space and um, in M E A T. So. It, it, pe it's not certain whether or not that that might kind of developmentally impede children in that way as well. Um, one of the interesting questions, and, and Eric can kind of respond to this as well, is um, people call VR an empathy machine. But some of the research that I've seen that's coming back on that, um, based on what you've said about disassociation, can actually question whether or not um, some people were put into an anti-racism related experience and came back um, actually more affirmed in their prior beliefs because they felt they had known what it was like to be someone else and it wasn't that bad, right? Um, so, so an awareness that VR can take us and take us to the point of relating to another person and another experience to a point. But it's not certain if, if, um, if, all of the, if all of the benefits will be clinically proven when um, when we know more about the behavioral implications of, of, of this in the long term. Eric, um, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. I, I, I mean, it, it's going to sound like it's going to sound like we colluded, but we didn't. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I just I, I agree with what uh, Britain is saying. I think one of the things that, you know, it's getting getting plopped into a well-designed immersive experience will change you. Um, and in some ways, those changes can be really good. They can be desired. They can be exactly what we hoped would happen. But I do think that, um, especially for perspective-taking empathy simulations, they're 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 full of problems. We do know, and this is also one of those balance and lab results, right? Is that you can succumb to something they've called the Proteus effect, and all that means is. Like when you embody someone else in virtual reality, you'll start to adopt some of the stereotypical behaviors you have associated with that kind of person, right? So if, you, if, you're, good, if you're put into Einstein's body in virtual reality, that will trigger certain kinds of stereotype responses you have associated with this age, but also like other kinds of mannerisms. And it's not clear that that's being done consciously. It, it might just be happening as a result of being embodied in that way. But I don't think that tells us anything about what it was like to be Einstein. Right. And so for the for the kinds of reasons that Britain was mentioning, I think when we use VR for things like anti-bias work, 
it's got to be really, really carefully controlled to not give the kind of misinformation that you now know what it's like. I think there are some ways of using virtual reality for anti-bias interventions that don't have that problem, but but the that that kind of empathy route is is a bad route. Uh, though empathy is a loaded word in lots of ways, so we can un unpack it if we need to. But yeah, I I, I would agree. So a question from the audience, um, I think for both of you, maybe more directly to Eric, do you see the ability to choose your embodiment as potentially self-revelatory in ways we have not contemplated and that creates a new category of personal information? Yes, and, and I think we don't know exactly what that will mean in a way, right? Uh, th so this is, this is stuff that I'm thinking about right now is about, you know, when we think about all the freedoms we have in terms of body modification, um, in, in this non-augmented space, right? There, we have a lot of freedom to modify it. You've seen images of people who take it about as far as I think we can take it, but we're always limited biologically by what we can do to the body. And in augmented reality, in the metaverse anyway, you just, there are no limits on your form of embodiment, right? You could be that giant robot. You couldn't do that in, in this space, meat space as it were, right? Like um, you could become a dragon. You can become, I can look just like you if I wanted to. Right. Uh, and so though the fact that there are no limits, I think, is just a it's one of the many challenges that we have in terms of things like certain forms of privacy. Right. That, and I do think that this this question about deep faking somebody else's physical appearance in, in augmented reality is something that we're we're not even exactly sure how to regulate deep fakes right now in a 2D you know, dimensional sense. And so in, in an immersive context, I'm not sure how to handle those, but yes, they will be transformative. I think we already see, as I tried to show you, like we already see people who are giving, investing more in their augmented reality forms of embodiment and their physical ones. And I don't even know if we have a good sort of social moral framework for thinking through those things yet, um, but they're there, like we have to. So, so Britton, you are revealing something about yourself by making yourself a flying toaster. I am, I am the brave little toaster, but um, I, 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 what I think is, is interesting is how, I don't want to say fungible because it brings up, you know, PTSD about NFTs, but um, I, I think the concept of identity when you're when you're considering all of these immersive technologies is is one that we're really going to have to grapple with you know when when i go to a restaurant in um in my daily life there are parts of my identity that are necessary for the transaction and there are other parts that aren't like my um you know my my race or my gender my religion aren't as relevant when i'm trying to buy a hamburger, but um, making sure that my credit card is attached to my identity, which is attached to my address, um, that, that, that does take precedence. So part of me started to think about identity in AR, VR being almost like a closet of different skins that you can put on for, for different reasons. Because I, like in the same way, like when I go to the doctor, they don't need to know what sports to my root for. So there, there's different types of information that we foreground for different types of person-to-person um, -person and commercial interactions in meat space. And I, I don't see why that can't be replicated in, in a virtual space, especially if we have control over um, visual representation and even the laws of physics, you know? My, my first time in VR was magical and uh, I, I could fly. It was... Um, I just, I remember the, the early experiences being transformative and being visceral, really visceral. Um, there was a, an experience where you, you jump off a building and that is something that you really shouldn't do in, in, in real life, but it really felt like falling off a building. And, um, and so when people talk about how you, you really shouldn't take the, this is gaming, you know, it's just pixels. You should just turn it off when somebody's harassing you or when something uncomfortable happens. It's, um, it's not, it's playing with this alchemy and, and your somatic self, as well as your identity, as well as your intellect. So it's, it's not just pixels on the screen. 
So that brings us to another good question from the audience um, uh, who says, um, I am concerned about virtual sensory inputs that trigger innate reflexes and the possibility of changing the user's emotional state, either accidentally or deliberately. Um, for example, an object moving fast from your peripheral to central visual field will trigger fear of a collision, not necessarily consciously. So how do you see that potential because it's so visceral um, and because it's designed by people who understand these things more than the users do? Do you see a potential for a manipulation, intentional or accidental? Eric, do you want to take this one first? I can jump in after. If you want. Sure. I mean, the 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 short answer is yes. Um, but I, you know, I I think what matters here is the the intention behind the use of this kind of stimulus, right? Um, for me and, and Eric, I know you know this, uh, as Sableman, but um, I think one of the one of the resounding successes for me in terms of virtual reality has been therapeutic uses, and and in particular things like virtual reality exposure therapy or um, other forms of therapy related uses of virtual reality can use exactly these kinds of things, right? Knowing that you can trigger certain kinds of responses in people that they might need to therapeutically work on helping to manage and control and so on can be really helpful. Um, at least the, 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 the meta analyses suggest that it's, it's, it's almost as good as traditional exposure therapy, definitely better than imaginative exposure therapy. So there, there's something there that I think you can, you can harness the ability to trigger involuntary responses for good, but, but you can also do this to manipulate people, right? Uh, uh, for for nudge-based manipulation to get them to prefer something on a shelf in a certain way. If you've got an augmented reality layer in a store that can make certain objects become more likely to be attended to than others, then, then we might be manipulating in, in ways that would at least require more justification. But but I think it, it works, depend for me, it's, it's, I'm not a Kantian like all the way down, but I, for me, it's I intent really matters. Like what are we using the technology to do? But absolutely, you can trigger in a uh, reflexive behavior. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna connect this question, if you don't mind, with another question from a person about um, are, are we going to see traditional online harms like disinformation and hate speech manifesting in, um, in VR? And the answer is absolutely. Like, uh, and, and so I think that that's predicated by the question you're talking about. The, this technology is very persuasive. There's evidence that it's more cognitively persuasive than reading than being taught one-on-one -on -one even. So we, we do need to understand how it works and create, now I'm getting on my soapbox, but create terms of service for platforms that recognize the differences between this and social media. Um, I, I can give you a good example of this that, that I think is, is really profound. Um, of two. One, how do you translate a spam policy into uh, AR, VR? I've been noodling on that for a few days. I think I came up with an answer, but I'm not going to tell you it. I want you to think about like, how does, how, what does spam look like in a spatial computing immersive environment? And then how do you create behavioral and systemic interventions to stop that? Two, um, there's a lot of debate around whether or not you want something to be, it, it, whether presence, so the feeling like you're really there, is increased by, um, by photorealism in VR AR. And there are some very high end, super cool things like the Varjo headset that look almost op like optically repl replicated pa pass through VR. They're, they make you really feel like you're driving that McLaren. Um, from from your from your dining room table, and like you're in Monaco, it's it's awesome. Um, but the the research says that um, the most effective treatments for PTSD are ones that are actually not photorealistic; they're representational. Um, people in, coming back from Afghanistan and Iraq reported night raids were some of the most stressful experiences that they had, breaking into a building and not knowing who was going to be there, if they were going to be a threat, or if they were going to actually be a danger being harmed themselves. So uh, or harming bystanders or harming the, the military personnel. So that is what's replicated. That experience is replicated in um, 
in PTSD trainings and they keep it intentionally vague and shaded. And what happens is that the brain fills in the gaps. So if the brain fills in the gaps and you make it, and it feels real to you because you, you see it as real based on your personal experience, um, how, do you, how does that translate over to um, people using, using weapons in VR? Is a photorealistic gun more poignant than a Roger Rabbit style gun? I would argue um, based on the research that the glorification of violence policies like you see in social media shouldn't take into account whether or not it actually looks like a real gun, but they should respond to the act of violence like your body will, like your mind will, and not, and not whether it looks like a picture of a weapon. So I think you guys have already touched on this, um, but um, maybe if you have others, what would you say are the most positive uses of this brand new technology that you've seen? Where does it seem to work better than other tools we had before? And you mentioned the, the therapeutic ones. Are there others that we should be thinking about? I think this talk, I think someone brought this up, but training. So, so things that are um, expensive or dangerous or novel, like going to the going in a submarine to the bottom of the ocean or cutting into somebody as a surgeon, or um, gosh, it's or experiencing Black Friday sales with a mob of people trying to get the latest toy, um, allowing people to kind of practice and get their reflexes and experience without having to put them, themselves or others in harm's way. That I think is great. Um, I think artistic representation is really fascinating and fabulous. Um, I also think other medical uh, interventions where one experience I did, um, for, the, um, for science and art too, I put my hundred year old grandmother in a headset and basically put her in into the blue and to the bottom of the sea. And she said that it was one of the most magical experiences of her life. And she just sort of enlivened in a way I hadn't seen in probably 20 years. Um, I did an experience that was actually a, uh, you, went, you went into this, uh, this little world, it was called cool. And you, you, figure out that you can shoot from your fingers rainbow trout at river otters. And they're animated, so it's like you're in a, in a Nintendo type game and you shoot the fish at the river, river otters and, if you, hit, and if, you, if you hit the river otter with the fish, they turn rainbow colors. And you float down the river, you feel like you're floating, you go through a cave, you go through a Sakura Bloom shower, you go through... All right, all right. It sounds like you could go for a long time describing this experience. Okay. Okay. But okay, we but the punchline really, okay. really enjoyed it. Yeah. The, the punchline is is it's pain mitigation software. Mm -hmm. And it was clinically proven to last twice as long as opioids. Because when you are in virtual when you are in happy otter land, you are not in your somatic self experiencing pain. So they gave it to people and asked them to think back to that experience and found that pain was treated more effectively than drugs. Oh, now I feel bad that I stopped you. <laughs> no, it's all right. It's all right. I just get excited about Happy Otter Land. So I, I appreciate you keeping me on track. Eric, are there others? I mean, those are pretty compelling examples. I, I also put my parents through the blue this, this last week. Oh, you did? Um, to, to, to similar, <laughs> actually the whale one was scary, but that, that makes sense. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, in general, I, actually not just in general, I agree with uh, Britain. I, I think for me, the, the therapeutic angles are, are just, it's, you know, in a way it shouldn't be surprising, I guess, if you think about the fact that if this is really just about talking about giving people experiences they're gonna treat as if they were real, then it, of course it's gonna have similar kinds of responses as real experiences, but it's fascinating and, and to me awesome to see it actually working that way. Um, you know, the, 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 They've even done um, the, the, the standard treatment for things like phantom limb pain, right? The mirror box uh, style thing you can do in VR and get results that work therapeutically. I think there's, there's a lot of good uses of VR for that kind of thing. And the fact that you can do it at scale, right? You don't need to hire all of these um, people to come in and put on the production because it just exists and can be delivered to anybody with the hardware anyway. Um, and I, I also just think the aesthetic, the aesthetic options are... They're, they might not be the, 
you know, the, the, the most, I don't know what you want to call them. They're, they're not to me like saying, oh, this person now literally feels better from phantom limb pain. But I think it's it's an untapped realm of expression that we're just developing a language for, right? Um, just as I think, just as it took some time to develop techniques and language for how to put film stories together, people are just kind of learning how to use a new language to for artistic expression in virtual reality. And so I'm excited to see what that means. I think um, an augmented reality layer is going to change fashion in ways we literally can't predict. Um, because it gives a new element, a new degree of expression that doesn't exist right now. It'll be interesting, if nothing else. So, so let me take us uh, far from fashion for a second. Um, um, <laughs> at the Markula Center, we have this thing called the um, ethical toolkit, design toolkit. And one of the tools is called Think of the Terrible People. So even as you guys are talking about all these uses, I'm thinking this could be used to enhance torture, right? In and, and scale it in ways we couldn't have before as well, right? So it goes back, I think, very strongly to your point about intent and about putting guardrails and about really helping people understand what this can do and what it is and what it isn't. So Britton, you have written about some first steps that you think need to be taken right now. You talked about uh, data localization as being important. You talked about potentially an industry-wide code of conduct modeled on the UN guiding principles for business and human rights. Can you, can you give us sort of a list of what you think needs to be done right now? Because we're running out of time really fast. Okay, as fast as I can, can get it out there. One, there are no best practices. Um, every time a client comes to me or, uh, or a, an internet safety organization concerned about this, they're like, what is the best thing to do? And, and I'm like, nobody knows yet. So I, I think it would be great for companies to actually combine their research and to make some decisions about what consent is gonna look like, what, what privacy is going to mean in a spatial computing environment. Um, two, there's no standardized physical vocabulary for this hardware. Um, when something bad happens to you or me on the way home, we know to call 911. Imagine if 911 was a different number in every city you drove through. You wouldn't be able to access emergency services. There are, there are protections for users when things go wrong in VR, but every interface is different. And uh, there's, there's not a standard way to, to signal that you need help. Um, three, I, I, I use the UN Guiding Principles for Business and Human Rights because it's about a protect, respect, remedy framework. It gives different responsibilities to government and to industry, and both are designed to protect, um, to create remedies. And it's also um, a consensus-based international standard. It's 10 years old at this point. So looking at, looking at what responsibility companies are going to have for their product, for their users, and for the impact, the unanticipated impacts of this will be very important going forward. And Eric, I'm going to take us a little bit into virtue ethics just to wrap up. What should individual developers and organizations that aspire to be ethical in their development and deployment of AR and VR do or avoid doing in order to live up to that aspiration? Yeah, and I think this is actually going to tie back to the toolkit in a lot of ways, right? I mean, mm -hmm. um, there, there are some easy ones, things like honesty and humility, right? This is what I was trying to get at earlier when I was talking about acknowledging the limitations of the technology, right? So don't sell it as doing something that it's not capable of delivering because of the, I think just the fallout that comes from that in terms of like empathy and perspective taking simulation. Um, compassion, which I would just say is, is a form of expanding the ethical circle, right? Which is to think about not just the, the intended user base, but all who might be affected. So even the, even what is it? Think of the terrible people. Is that what it is? So, so think of the terrible people, right? Um, not only people who would misuse it, which to me is, is one of the, I, I think I saw a question through the Q and A that was kind of about this when I was, you know, one of the things I worry about is augmented reality embodiment. It explodes choice, right? It makes, it lets you express yourself in any way you possibly want to, but that means, right? That I can not only deep fake somebody else's identity. I can uh, engage in digital blackface. I can do a lot of things if I'm empowered to choose how I look to other people that we, we might want to regulate anyway, or at least might want to try and control or limit, but that itself then 
calls up its own regulatory questions. Who should limit? Who should be empowered to? How do we track users in this way? I think there are just, um, there are so many questions that need to be addressed about how things are going to work in this space, either if it's one platform like, like uh, Horizons or if it's many different ones that we float between. Um, I, I, I think it's, it's going to be a lot of work. But, but yeah, courage to acknowledge limitations, but also to say no to products that I think might have clearly foreseeable harms or misuses uh, is one of the hardest things to, to do, is to, is to stop the production of something for ethical risk reasons anyway. So I heard honesty and humility and courage. Compassion. And compassion. Um, Britton, would you add any others? I really like all of those. So I'm, I, I can't add anything better. Just want to make sure that we're not just leaving ethics for the ethicists, because that's also something we say all the time. Ethical <laughs> decisions are things that we all of us make in our daily lives all the time. I guess um, I would add prudence as a virtue that seems to come into play here. <laughs> Um, and I think uh, one group I left out, um, but that we've been talking about um, implicitly in our conversation are regulators, right? I mentioned organizations and developers, but what regulators need to do and think about right now is also really important. Maybe grace as well, because the hardware is not solidified. It's still a nascent industry and there is going to be missteps, but that doesn't mean we should give up on it all. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, one thing that we haven't captured, so maybe we'll leave that sort of vague at the end, but but that kind of magical quality that you both were describing, you know, and, and inviting, you know, people you care about to strap these things on because you knew that they would have those feelings. Um, what's the virtue term for that, right? Um, I mean, there's wonder, wonder and creativity um, very much as well. So we are at time. And I want to thank very much our speakers for a wonderful conversation and thank all of you and apologize to all of you for all of the questions we didn't get to. I think we could have, um, you know, at least an annual event talking about AR, VR ethics, and we would have new questions all the time. Thank you again for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.